And when they came to me, I explained I'm a judge and it's really nice. I wear a uniform. Have I mentioned the uniform? <laughs> so I told them. And then I said, do you have any questions? And the two questions came that I'll never forget. The first one, which has nothing to do with your question, one of them asked me, how much money do you make? <laughs> I thought I was prepared for that class. And if it's crossing your mind to ask me that question, just scratch this one out. Not a good question. <laughs> So, so I said to this student, this kid, I said, well, actually, this, normally this is not a question, this is a very private thing, so you may not want to ask the others. I could see my other co-panelists were starting to be a bit fidgety. This, you know, you don't ask people how much money they make, it's very private, but actually, in my case, it is appropriate, you ask me, because my salary is paid by your parents. So it's, in, it's a matter of public information, so I'll tell you. I told him, and that night my son told me I was very cheap because his allowance was pathetic <laughs> compared to This was very bad. This was not my answer. But then the other guy, this is coming back to your story, he said to me, are you scared? Are you ever scared that the bad guys will come after you? And it was a, it was a revelation. I don't know exactly how I put it to him, but it was so clear to me that the reason the system works um, well, I knew that sort of intellectually, but I, I, it was so clear to me. Law, criminal law, for instance, people think of it as being coercive, but it's not actually. It works by compliance. I mean, the reason we don't kill each other is not because the law says you shouldn't, and if you do, you're going to go to prison. It's because it reflects a very widely shared social consensus. It's all about compliance, and we believe we accept collectively some restrictions on our personal uh, freedoms to enhance our collective security and so on. We all buy into the system. And even those who break the law have bought in, and that's why when I was a judge, I voted in favor, I ruled in favor of prisoners having the right to vote. Because it seems to me that's part of buying into the system um, you know, if you don't like the law, don't break it, just change the government and, you know, there is a system for addressing your issues. You've got to be inside the box. Internationally, we're not there yet. And that's the big challenge. It's a big challenge politically to end, we'll get there. I mean, this, when I was the prosecutor of these tribunals, it was the first time since Nuremberg that there had been any effort of accountability for catastrophic massacres uh, by leaders against very often their own populations. This is started 15 years ago. It's now completely irreversible as a movement. But in terms of having the right institutions, we're a long, long way from having exactly that culture of compliance and, and acceptance and credibility. I had a few others. Yes, I'll just take you. If you have questions on that side, you'll have to scream because, or I'll have to push my chair a bit so I see you. Yes. That's interesting. Uh, I suppose it, maybe it goes back to when I went to law school. I went to law school very much by default. Again, no role model. Nobody in my family was a judge or a lawyer or a criminal, at least as far as I know. <laughs> um, so I had no, um, but you know, you came out in those days with a classical college degree. You went to medical school, engineering, law. It just what, it was very, very limited. And most women, I came from a, I'm the only one, I think another girl in my class came to law school, one or two went to medical school, and most others went to a kind of teacher's college or did like a master's in art history or something. It, they just weren't a ton of options. So I went to law very much by default. Medicine was not, I'd done too much Greek and Latin to feel that I qualified for anything scientific and I had no particular interest. I went to law school thinking, I, I had a general interest in public life, journalism, politics, just things, vaguely interested me. 
And then I found, you know, talk about finding your match. Within a first semester, a lot of lawyers will tell you how much they hated law school. It was a perfect fit for me. I think it had the right balance of uh, intellectual challenge. I mean, some of this stuff is just intricate. Enough, not too much, but just enough that you have to work it out with some moral con and ethical content. Just, it just was a very good fit. And then I realized in the law, I then found these pathways that had that as well. I taught criminal law for the most part, which again has exactly that. And then I never thought in my lifetime that criminal law would take this international scope. So when that opened, I mean, the opportunity to connect with that was just startling. And so, so it came, I think, essentially from my substantive um, professional interest. So for people now who even see um, potential international work or have an interest in that, I would say first get a skill, particularly in the human rights, you know, I worked in the human rights business. I met tons of young people who were all very keen to do that kind of work, human rights work. And I, my advice to them was always, if you want to do that kind of work, that means you have the heart for it. Now you have to get the skills to go with it. Your heart is not going to build latrines in refugee camps, right? You got to, you have to, and it, the skills, they could be almost anything. I mean, everything is needed and everything comes together. It could, whatever the skills are, but you have to have some sort of professional competencies. And, um, in my opinion, if you can acquire languages, it's really critical because it's also the vehicle to um, sending signals that you're prepared to work in a pluralistic environment. To say it, but always to say it in English, only gets you so far. It helps to have the, the resonance that comes from having many languages. Yes? I just wanted to ask about your experience with the UN and the international crisis groups in the context of Africa. You know, you, in the last two decades, I mean, we've seen in many regions of Africa with some, some pretty horrific things that have happened. And when you look at how deeply, how, how far back the roots of that go with colonialism, like what are your thoughts in terms of leadership in Africa today and sort of the prognosis or hope for peace and some stability across those regions um, in the future? Well, I could give you, first of all, the, the sort of vaguely scientific answer is that contrary to, to sometimes public assumptions, uh, armed conflicts are seriously on the decline. We have, well, certainly we have fewer international wars and actually we have fewer uh, internal armed conflict now than we did even 20 years ago. And, there, and, and this is just data collected. Um, this is in part um, because of the end of the wars of liberation in Africa, so all the wars associated with the end of colonialism. The end of all the proxy wars that were fought during the Cold War, where rather than the two big powers engaging, they were uh, financing proxy wars in Africa and, and elsewhere in Latin America. So there's been, we're now, actually surprisingly in a relatively peaceful time and the numbers of casualties associated with armed conflict have also decreased considerably in part it's because of military um, uh, capacity for kind of surgical strikes you know much more targeted interventions or that the remaining wars are very low intensity um, uh, wars that's the good news and Many of those who are examining this uh, conclude that it is in large part attributable to the increase in international engagement, um, in part by the humanitarian organizations from Médecins Sans Frontières to Oxfam to CARE to, that are on the ground. A kind, it's a kind of protection by presence and it's flooded. It's not just the UN. It's a massive amount of large, large NGOs and local NGOs. Um, that are present and, and uh, alleviating, in a, in a sense, um, the intensity of war and a lot of its side effects by preventing a lot of casualties, bringing medicine and food and, and support. Um, leadership, I mean, I, 
you've studied it, I haven't, but it seems to me we often use the term always with a benevolent connotation, but in and of itself, it's a, lead, it's a neutral term. You could lead in any direction. The leadership I have dealt with professionally was pathologically bad. You know, I, I indicted leaders, very bad leaders, but very effective leaders who mobilized people to kill and to do extraordinary bad things. Um, but so my point is leadership in and of itself and the, the attributes, I won't say the qualities, but the attributes could be used depending on the nature of your project. To some extent, I think there's a historical momentum for transition in Africa and we are probably entering, just about to enter a transitional phase where the likes of uh, Robert Mugabe, for instance, not only will not have the legitimacy that comes from their early contribution to the liberation of their country, but will also not enjoy the support of their peers who are still deferential to something they did 30 years ago. So I think there's a chapter that, that just has to, to um, close. Um, and, and some of it, I think, is not dependent on one or two particular persons. Now, on the other hand, I think Africa will experience a lot of other challenges um, with the uh, uh, exploitation of natural resources. So there's an economic underbelly there where the Chinese are playing a big role uh, just at a time where the more traditionally dominant Western type um, um, multinationals had just started very often through the pressure of their shareholders to bring some, some uh, element of uh, uh, social corporate responsibility were under more scrutiny. Now the competition is coming in with none of these constraints. So we may see, I think, a lot of sliding back um, in conflict generated around the exploitation of natural resources, which could be aggravated by climate change, which will increase competition for scarce uh, resources. Yes? I'm interested that you said that the conflictual nature of the world is partly due to the problems with distribution of wealth uh, that goes on. And I'm assuming if you've said that, that you must perhaps look for places where someone or something or some place is doing something about that. And because you have a global perspective, I'd be interested to hear whether or not you could share with us something that might be new or surprising or inspiring to us about some place or somewhere where someone's dealing with that problem of distribution of wealth. <laughs> um, the the it seems to me, if you look at what's happened in North Africa, for instance, starting in Tunisia, Egypt, and spreading in the region, it was a pretty toxic mixture of unconscionable economic inequities. So not just um, widespread um, uneven wealth distribution, but which is the case elsewhere, but not based or not perceived to be based on any kind of merits. Now, if you look at America, for instance, and you came from another planet, you might ask why uh, a basketball player or a movie star makes, whatever, a thousand times more than the minimum wage that millions of Americans earn to make a living and raise their family. You might ask yourself that question. But it doesn't matter because, for the most part, Americans have bought into the idea that this is based on some kind of merit. In other words, it's not corrupt. Uh, it may be bizarre. Um, it, sometimes there may be some grumbling, but for the most part, the social contract has accepted that this is a form of meritocracy. There's a form of rational equity in it. In Tunisia, when the, the family of the president, particularly of his wife, were controlling just amongst a smaller and smaller and smaller circle of their closest family members and friends, inequities of the same nature, maybe not even greater or, than you would find, say, in America, became completely unacceptable because there's no suggestion of merit, purely corrupt. 